All right, so it's time to talk about one of the more complicated and, you know, in some ways interesting topics when it comes to modern campaigns, and that's where the money comes from and why it's a controversy. So the first thing we can talk about is the fact that this is a First Amendment issue. People debate how many restrictions should be able to be imposed upon people's expression of their political beliefs when it comes to the spending of their money. Does the spending of money equal speech? If you're running an advertisement, if you're um, donating to campaigns, should there be limits on how much you can donate because you really are just trying to express your support? If you have no limits, you're basically acknowledging, acknowledging that unlimited funds means you know the wealthy can buy elections. If you put lots of restrictions on it, then all of a sudden there's a lot of questions about are you violating people's First Amendment rights? So it's a tricky area. Where do you draw the line? A lot of the current guidelines that are still in place today come from a bill that was passed in 2002 called the McCain-Feingold Bill, also known as the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act. It was named after its sponsors, John McCain and, and Russell Feingold, a Republican and a Democrat. And there's some things that you probably are familiar with. For example, the stand by your ad provision. Here's a picture of Barack Obama saying that he approves this message, which is something that we see in any political ad now. It's actually required that candidates acknowledge when an advertisement has been paid for by them because there are a lot of advertisements that aren't paid for by them. And so there needs to be no ambiguity about who is actually the one doing the speaking. Is it a campaign, a candidate? Or is it some sort of a third-party group that the campaign then says, well, we had nothing to do with that. That was that was over the line. That was an inappropriate message. We, we didn't run that ad. That, that comes up as well. Campaign finance reform in 2002 was designed to eliminate what was called soft money. Hard money is money that is spent by the campaign, that is donated directly to the campaign, and it is restricted in how much can be contributed. So individuals can only contribute so much to a campaign and so much to outside regular political action committees, which spend in support of a campaign. So an individual can spend around $2,800 to a campaign and I think 5000 or so to a political action committee. They can donate that much. You can also, of course, donate less in an election cycle. Those are those are in the, the rule books. Um, they're, they're, they're enforced by the Federal Election Commission. And you have to file paperwork if you're going to be accepting money, and you have to disclose where all your money came from as a campaign. What McCain-Feingold also did, though, was it put restrictions on outside spending for political purposes in the months prior to an election. So it said if you're an outside group, you you can't be spending unlimited amounts of money uh, unless you're a, a political action committee, and a political action committee has limits on how much they can they can spend and how much they can uh, take in from donors. So you couldn't run, you know, you couldn't start a company, or or as a large company, you couldn't run an ad supporting Donald Trump or supporting Hillary Clinton theoretically um, 30 days prior to the election or 60 days prior to the election. Um, except in 2016, you could do that because in 2010. The Supreme Court heard a, heard a case called Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission. There was an anti-Hillary Clinton movie called Citizens United that in 2008 was not allowed to run prior to the 2008 primaries in which Hillary Clinton was running against Barack Obama. Uh, this was challenged as a First Amendment violation, and it basically overturned provisions of McCain-Feingold and said fundamentally that Outside groups can spend whatever they want on campaigning, on supporting candidates, and to take away that right would be to take away their First Amendment freedom of expression. So the constitutional clause here is a, it's a First Amendment case, and it has important, uh, significant impacts on the modern political landscape. And I want to play a couple of videos. The first one I want to play is not long after the Supreme Court uh, made the decision in the Citizens United case. Barack Obama had a notable moment in his State of the Union address in which he actually criticized the Supreme Court's decision while the Supreme Court justices were sitting right in front of him uh, during the State of the Union. And so I'll play that. It was a really interesting moment um, from almost a decade ago now. With all due deference to separation of powers, last week the Supreme Court reversed a century of law that I believe will open the floodgates for special interests, including foreign corporations. 
to spend without limit in our elections. I don't think American elections should be bankrolled by America's most powerful interests, or worse, by foreign entities. They should be decided by the American people. And I'd urge Democrats and Republicans to pass a bill that helps correct. So uh, one of the notable moments from this particular uh, 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 video was when Samuel Alito, who's, who's right here, he, he kind of shook his head and, and made a, a response. He said, you know, no, no, I don't agree with that. That's not true. Um, to the president during the State of the Union address. And typically the, the tradition is that the justices sit there, they're not political, they don't clap. That was not unusual to see them sit there and not clap. But in, in the fact that he actually gave some sort of response was something people thought was very unusual. It highlights the importance of this issue, that the president actually spoke out and criticized the Supreme Court to their face in front of the nation in the State of the Union address, saying, I don't agree with this decision in Citizens United. I think it went too far in allowing outside groups to spend huge amounts of money on campaigns. One of the things that the FEC did after the Citizens United case was they allowed these outside groups to actually create organizations that they called super PACs, super political action committees, that could then basically collect unlimited amounts of money from corporations, from people, from unions, and then they could spend that money on campaigns as they see fit. The only restriction is if you are running a super PAC, you're not supposed to coordinate with a political campaign. Now, I have a, another video here that shows a, uh, kind of runs down a series of uh, episodes of the Colbert Report in 2011, in which Stephen Colbert tried to explain to his viewers what a super PAC was, how it functioned, and how there might be some loopholes in how they can coordinate with campaigns. So I'm going to play this for you as well, and then talk about it. In 2011, back when Stephen Colbert was still playing the mock conservative pundit version of Stephen Colbert, his show launched an actual super PAC called A Better Tomorrow Tomorrow. It was all played for comic effect, but there are a few important features of super PACs that Colbert called out. After the Citizens United case, Colbert himself exploited the new rules that govern how political action committees, or PACs, do business. Lesson one? Supersize it. How do I turn this into a super PAC? All you have to do is send a cover letter to the commission that says this PAC is actually a super PAC. A super PAC is like a normal political action committee, but with fewer rules. When Colbert first launched his PAC, Comedy Central's parent company, Viacom, asked that he shut it down. Instead, on the advice of former FEC chairman Trevor Potter, Colbert converted it to a super PAC. So here's my form. That's a regular PAC that cannot take money or a gift in kind from Viacom. Right. Now it's a super PAC? Right. OK. PAC, <laughs> super PAC. There you go. Lesson two, anonymize. This says that you are the sole director of the corporation. I am. And that you are now electing yourself president, secretary, and treasurer. Uh, sounds like a great board. Super PACs can accept unlimited amounts of money in donations. Calling on Potter's help yet again, Colbert set up a shell corporation in the state with the most lenient reporting rules, Delaware. Now, I don't have to go to Delaware, do I? No, it's already been done for you. <whistles> OK. Lesson three, embrace the absurdity. When it comes to cooperation between campaigns and super PACs, the rules push the boundaries of common sense. In early 2012, Colbert began a brief campaign to run for the president of the United States of South Carolina, and the super PAC began running ads. Now, because a super PAC can't coordinate with a campaign, Colbert had to give up control of a better tomorrow tomorrow. So naturally, he handed it off to Jon Stewart, who promised that he was totally independent of his partner in crime. Can we do this because you and I are also business partners? Yes, we're business partners. So I don't know. Is that a problem? Trevor, is being business partners a problem? Being business partners does not count as coordination legally. Great. The super PAC shut down in 2012 after the death of its fictional manager, Ham Rove. When it shut down, the Colbert Super PAC donated its remaining money to charity, and the Colbert Report won a Peabody Award for its coverage. So that video 
highlight some of the contradictions inherent in how super PACs work. And now you have campaigns pledging to not use a super PAC, which is kind of ironic because they're not supposed to even be able to acknowledge that they can use a super PAC. You know, Bernie Sanders says, I don't have a super PAC. Or I won't use a super PAC. Well, of course he won't. He's not allowed to coordinate with a super PAC, except everyone knows that all these major candidates now do have super PACs that they do sort of coordinate with. And these super PACs can raise unlimited sums of money and spend this money however they see fit on campaigning. So although the candidates themselves are raising huge amounts of money, the Citizens United case also means that outside groups and or super political action committees are also spending huge amounts of money in the political process, far more than they did in years past. That remains controversial, and some people, including some of the justices on the Supreme Court there, are fervent defenders of that being a First Amendment right. And we know that exercising First Amendment rights isn't always something that is you know, done for good. And perhaps it's the price we have to pay, no pun intended, for having the freedom of expression. Uh, you know, maybe you are going to have a little bit too much money in politics, but at least you have the First Amendment. On the other side, people say we need more regulations, we need more restrictions, just like we have restrictions on other freedoms of expression. It's not unlimited. So there's a lot to unpack here. I encourage you to watch this video multiple times if you need to. Ask me questions if you have them, and we'll talk about this more in class.